Hello, the gang's all here. All right, we're gonna continue our uh, PLA, Public Library Conference uh, kickoff event. So we just saw um, another presentation with um, some of the Koha community. They were talking about libraries responding in crisis. Um, so we're gonna continue our conversation about community um, in today's presentation. My name is Cal Marquise. I work on the Aspen Discovery team at Bywater Solutions. Um, and I'm joined with some of our fabulous members of the Aspen Discovery community today uh, to talk about the professional communities that we build um, as library staff members, as librarians, um, and the kind of like the behind the scene relationships that help support the communities that we serve. Um, and just some of the, the challenges and the opportunities that we have working in a remote environment. So um, I was hoping that everyone could just take uh, just a minute to introduce yourself, um, let us know who you are, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, the libraries and the communities that you serve. So uh, Mark, do you wanna say hi first? Sure, I'm Mark Noble. I'm the Aspen architect. I've been working um, in a variety of roles on Aspen in a variety of places for like a dozen years now. So it's really fun. And I love working with all of our wonderful partners. So uh, what's next? Sam, you wanna go next? Sure, um, I'm Sam Passy. I'm the director of UNA County Library in Vernal, Utah. Um, we have a library that operates with a local museum and community archive. Um, we were the first library to use Aspen Discovery and be supported by Bywater Solutions. Happy to be here and share a little bit. And uh, take it away, Bob. Hi, I'm Bob Benhoff. I am the manager of Aspen Cat, and we're located in Colorado, and we're kind of all over the state. Uh, by the summer, we'll have over 150 libraries of all library types, academic, school, public, uh, and even prison libraries and some special libraries too. So it's a real unique mix, and uh, we've been using uh, we've been using Aspen Discovery almost as long as Sam has. And then uh, a previous iteration of it, working with Mark before even all that. Hi, I'm Tara. I'm the user experience manager with Swan Library Services, which is a consortium of 100 libraries in the um, west and south suburbs of Chicago. Um, and we uh, are actually going to be live on Aspen tomorrow. We had sort of a cohort based rollout. So we have about half of our libraries that went live um, in the fall. And so the remainder of our libraries go live tomorrow. So we're super excited. That's awesome. We're excited too. It's been, how long have you been in implementation now? Like, has it been a year at this point? Maybe? Maybe almost two. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. I hope there's some sort of pizza party or something that you're planning for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So today we're going to talk, like I said, a little bit about um, libraries in the virtual world, um, implementations, Aspen community, um, a little bit of everything. But um, if, if you want, we can just jump right in and we can talk a little bit about um, the virtual world. So I would just like everyone to just like go around and just talk a little bit about um, what challenges you've faced. I, I know in the last couple of years, especially with the pandemic, um, we've all worked more in a virtual environment, a lot of this, a lot of Zoom, a lot of uh, less in person. Um, so we'd like to hear a little bit about like maybe some what challenges that you faced in a virtual environment and maybe some successes um, as well. Um, whoever wants to get us started. I can jump in. Um, I will say, I think um, one of the, the challenges we've certainly had with members, I, I think it's more um, not necessarily a challenge for us as consortia staff, but for our library staff, having our user groups and member meetings as a networking opportunity, I can tell that folks are really missing that sort of, you know, gather around the snack table and chat about what your library is up to. Um, and that is really hard to do, I think, successfully in, um, in a virtual environment. But on the other hand, kind of a success that we've seen is we're 
we've been able to get engagement with more library staff that otherwise couldn't get away from the desk for the kind of whole commute, maybe even up to an hour away um, at, a, at a physical location. So there's quite a few folks that have liked the online meetings format and been able to get more involved in a way they weren't before. Yeah, one of the one of the challenges for us has been so much of the innovation that used to happen kind of while we were in the hallway of the conference room meeting with the vendor or um, with our colleagues, just the stuff that's not planned that just kind of happens. That's been a challenge for us to pick that up. But uh, like Tara said, it does allow for more people to be involved. So instead of the two or three people from our library that might have had travel dollars to go somewhere, now 20 people can be involved if they want. So it's, it's plus or minus is there, but it's been a lot of fun. So I, I actually worked uh, remotely before all of this and then was back in the office for a while. So personally, it wasn't as huge of adjustment for me, but it was a huge adjustment for the libraries we work with who are not always as uh, as used to these, these type of technologies. But within that, uh, I think there's been a huge opportunity because previous there was a lack of comfort there. And I think it's not all the way there yet, but it's better than it was. And we used to find that we actually had to go to the library in some cases to really get a sense of what was going on there. And if you think about how big the state of Colorado is and there's mountain ranges, it makes it a little unwieldy to try to uh, cover the whole state on foot. So uh, we, we've had a lot more success uh, with people being more comfortable in an online environment and being able to provide more trainings than we would have because you know we could do multiple trainings at different places across the state in a day Whereas if you're driving from one place to another, you're limited by uh, how much time you're spending in a car, that type of thing. Speaking of successes, um, does anyone have a, a success story? Kind of, I know um, in the previous presentation, one of the um, librarians spoke about having curbside and how like that will never go away now. And like, if it wasn't for this for this forced like virtual kind of world that we're living in, um, maybe they would have never considered that for their patrons. And I'm just wondering if anyone else has like a similar story or maybe a virtual tool or a success story for either their patrons or their staff that they think that they would, you know, continue to move forward with. Well, I, I had a library that, and maybe this isn't something that'll help other libraries as an example, but um, but there was a library that contacted me at the beginning of the pandemic that went, we don't really have a website, an online catalog, or any of these things, and we're closed, so we got to get moving with this. So we were able to uh, move that library into uh, you know a, a more modern time because that need arose, and I know they weren't the only one. Uh, that uh, that has done that during this, but I think it was kind of a wake up call. And so curbside is like down the road, getting like a website is a uh, higher priority. <laughs> you know, one, one of the innovations that came up for us is, um, I, I'd mentioned that we have a community archives that we, we run and probably 90% of their uh, document files are sitting in a box on a shelf or maybe they're on microfilm. They've been really good about digitizing pictures uh, because there's been a lot of interest in digital photos for a long time. But some of these documents, they're rarely looked at, but when someone comes in, they'll come in for four hours at a time. They couldn't do that. And so we found a way to quickly uh, digitize these. Actually, we already had the PDFs because um, someone had took on that project when it was slow and they couldn't have patrons come in. So they're like, ah, we'll just scan this stuff, but they didn't know where to put it. And so we were able to link all those PDFs to their corresponding catalog records in Aspen Discovery. And now people can browse from home and look at those. And once we did that, now the, the researchers are saying, hey, how about those oral histories? How about this other stuff that's just kind of there? And um, we're like, yeah, we can do some of this stuff. But it's, and the other thing that it's led to is, people living much farther away that are part of our community, expats maybe that have moved on, but still their heart is here and, and we're able to connect with those folks and some of our colleagues and stuff. Yeah, I think 
for us as service, we're seeing that um, it, we we do anticipate it's going to stick around quite a while is um, lockers and drive up windows. Um, we've seen kind of, curbside seems to be sort of a some libraries have had success, others not so much. Um, but the the lockers and um, drive up windows have turned out to be really popular and I think in some cases more sustainable for the staff. Um, and certainly uh, it pushed us as a consortium to kind of figure out some better options for patrons to be able to select those drive up windows and, and lockers um, as, a, as a separate pickup location, which was always, we were always sort of kind of told like, oh, I don't know, we can do something like that. <laughs> and, and we were really glad that we could find a solution and now patrons can just pick those locations in, in Aspen. Yeah, I think the silver lining of, of everything has just been like the forced innovation in, in some cases and like all the years that of just being told no, all of a sudden it was just like survival mode of like, yes, like whatever, whatever we can do uh, to keep moving forward. So I think that's, thank you for all for sharing that. Um, any like virtual tools that you all love or want to shout out that you've used in your libraries or um, that you found successful with like staff or um, even patrons? You know, some of the things um, that we've used, well, really not so much with patrons, but with our colleagues, things like Zoom and Slack and the fact that uh, all of us here in this room are spread across the country. I think I'd met Mark vaguely in person once about a decade ago and then again at a conference last year. But um, so much of the communication, you know, frequent, it's just uh, it's a new reality, a new dynamic. Um, one of the things that's always been amazing to me about, uh, um, you know, the Koha and the Aspen communities now are being able to not just have someone sell you some software, but kind of joining a community and what that looks like and that you've got a seat at the table um, and helping shape things, even if you're not the biggest spender in the room. I think one of the things that we were surprised that uh, was popular again after trying this years ago and having nobody ever watch them was uh, doing some webinars for some training. Uh, those were all of a sudden like getting a lot of looks and uh, and uh, not just a good amount of people show up in person, but then also uh, views on the video. We never used to get anybody ever watching any video that wasn't current. And now all of a sudden that's happening again. So it's not like a new or fancy technology, but uh, it seems like some of the needs have shifted and uh, some of those older technologies are meeting those needs. Yeah, I would say the biggest, we actually didn't have Zoom. We were using a different tool. Um, and we ended up getting Zoom early in the pandemic because of breakout rooms. <laughs> So that is my favorite. Um, I think my favorite virtual tool is I, I found that having breakout rooms and meetings like kind of helps fill in that gap of the kind of lack of networking opportunities I was talking about earlier. I'm just kind of when you have a huge group of 30 or 100 people, if you're able to put them in some kind of smaller, smaller groups to do some group work and then come back and share, um, that's been super helpful. Yeah, we've utilized that in our annual conference because we used to break people into groups and it was a great chance for them to interact and they miss that and they can't do it in person. And it's not the perfect substitution for it, but it definitely is something. It's a lot better than uh, than trying to get people to talk when there's uh, 50 people in a meeting all at once. You know, one of the other cool things is that... Um, the, the saying is that open source software is, you know, free as in puppy or kitty that you've got to raise, not as in beer. Um, and, and so we can take on community roles. We can join one another and kind of help with some of that at work, whether it's quality assurance testing or just helping spread word about stuff, <clears throat> developing training materials. Um, I, that's one thing that I've never got enough time to do is, is develop training materials. And so it's always so nice to have some of these larger systems that are, that are in the room say, Hey, we actually did a training on that. Here's, here's all this stuff. We're happy to share it. And just this 
this culture of sharing. You might be uh, raising that free puppy, but there's a really nice dog park you can go to and meet other dog owners and stuff. Yeah, I also like to shout out the QR code during this time because I thought that that was one of those technologies that was just dead and we really tried to make it happen a couple years ago and it it seemed like every um if you wanted to eat at a restaurant at any point in time you had to know how to use a qr code so i've seen that transition to a lot of uh libraries and library marketing materials and and that's one of those tools that i've noticed uh, the last couple of years that has definitely made a, a renaissance as well so <laughs> all right and we talked a little bit about um the, the implementation process and the, the going live as we call it um uh, on Aspen or other, you know, big migrations uh, during the last couple of years. So I think we have a couple of different uh, perspectives that I think it would be nice to share. So um, Tara talked a little bit about their uh, slow rollout. Um, I know we have some like continuous rollout, uh, like Bob talked about, they're adding um, more libraries. Uh, it seems like all the time, every month, something like that. Um, and then I know uh, Sam is just a fan of uh, let's just go for it. So I would love to hear your different um, perspectives of of what of what an implementation or a migration um, is like, especially when you have to communicate that these changes are happening uh, to your staff, your community, your patrons, your stakeholders. Um, yeah, so I'll just go for it. Um, <laughs> we. Uh, we're kind of building the airplane, you know, as, as we're going on this thing and figuring out, well, you know, what, what parts do we need? What's mission critical? What, what isn't? And when we got to the point where we felt like, you know, there's still some bells and whistles here that we're working on that we'd love to see happen, but it's got all the basics. We just went for it. And, um, we one day switched the in-house OPEX over. We put up, put out some flyers and things, and took out some some ads in the paper. I realize how old-fashioned that sounds, but around here in rural town, it does some good still. Um, I, and and we just went for it, and we kind of watched the statistics on the server, see how many hits are going, and every once in a while, someone would ask a question. But with Aspen, especially. It's, it works the way you would expect a modern consumer focused website to work as an account, as checkout options, it, you know, all the, all the things that there was no like user manual required for how to do the basics on, on it. And, you know, certainly as some things came up, it's like, you know, it'd be really cool if there's a 30 second video about doing this or that or the other, or, um, I still have staff that are looking up good reads outside of this thing all the time. Do they know that they can get basically the same information by expanding a box? And if everyone's having to expand that box, can we just by default make that box expanded? And, and there's the granularity and flexibility to do those kinds of things. That's, and we're, a, we're all on one campus. Typically we can physically talk to one another, um, go shout in someone's office and, um, but we're in a partnership with a couple other counties and we can't do that so much with them. And so that required a little bit more um, communication, but we're small enough that it was easy to make decisions and move forward. And I, I can only imagine that in the bigger systems, it's not the technology that's the hard part. It's gotta be the, the coordinating all the answers to fill in those boxes at migration time. So when we initially went over, we were using a kind of a different uh, different version of this this original view find type thing that, um, like I mentioned earlier, Mark had worked on earlier. So it wasn't it, it, our transition for the the big group of libraries wasn't as difficult because there were a lot of similarities, uh, particularly at that time. But uh, as Cal pointed out, we are adding libraries on a regular basis. So what we are able to do with that is we're able to uh, talk with them and go through a series of questions and really get a sense of what customizations they need. And in some cases, if it's like a really small school district, maybe they don't even need, 
they don't even need it at this time and they're they're going to look at it later in other cases it, it's definitely one of the attractive things uh that is bringing that library to our group so uh where we go through those customizations and make sure they get all set up unfortunately things are flexible enough that we're able uh to ask a series of questions put in a few hours of work to get all those settings in there and then they can come in and they they get uh, pretty much what they want uh and it's not like um it doesn't really affect other libraries if they have those customizations which is another great feature uh for the most part uh each thing is it can be done in individually branch by branch Yeah, so I know we were probably the tortoises to your hair, <laughs> but um, we started with setting up um, a test instance with Bywater. We knew that would be um, essentially like our biggest hurdle was not the technology. It wasn't the setup. It was just convincing our members that this is the way to go. Um, they're a very savvy and opinionated group, um, and we, we wanted to make sure we could um, Make everyone happy so um we set it up set up a test and kicked the tires and identified some enhancement requests kind of off the bat um and um we also partly because of our size in terms of even though i think we have fewer fewer libraries than bob but um we have a lot of stuff so we definitely wanted to make sure um you know this kind of volume of the system could handle all that because there would be nothing more terrible than you know you go live in your shiny catalog and it crashes uh, and we just had lots of bad experiences in the past of things crashing, so we want to avoid that um and then we uh, once we kind of went through that initial testing phase we set up a pilot with a group of seven libraries to um, go through training with them, customizations, how they could customize their own catalogs. Um, and, and we also set up some customizations kind of off the bat for them. Um, and in that time, we also did some research looking at um, just comparing like search relevancy and results between our current catalog and Aspen and just to have some data to again, to talk everyone into it, um, and just some usability testing with patrons um, to identify um, ways that we can make the catalog better, um, but also kind of showing to, sh you know, also show our, our member libraries, like, hey, this is, these things are working a lot better than they were in our old catalog. Um, and then from the pilot, we added a couple more libraries. Now we're adding our other batch and we've done some work. We are, we have, um, 95 public libraries and then a few special libraries in schools. So we've worked with them individually for some of those customizations. Um, and then, yeah, it's really been surprisingly smooth so far. Um, we are, in terms of communications, our libraries really have handled a lot of that, but Bywater provided some great templates in Canva, which have been very popular um, to help make some like quick start guides and bookmarks for patrons. Um, so. Yeah, folks have been excited and getting the word out and a lot of patrons don't even know there's a new catalog. They just <laughs> see that it's it's a little bit different and better and they kind of think it's just, um, you know, an extension of, of the library catalog they've been using, which is ideal. I definitely say the fun thing with implementing all of the different sizes. Um, I mean, Given how long we've been working on this, it, it's really fun to see all of the different sizes. I think one of the things we really value is all of the differences between libraries. Because um, everybody's using the catalog and we all have the same basic goals where we want to, to have all of our materials discoverable and that kind of thing. But how Sam is using it is significantly different than how Bob's using it, how Tara's using it. So we just love the opportunity to to talk with everybody and really understand your libraries and how they work. And a prison library is significantly different than, than a public library is significantly different than an academic library. So it's it's so fun and valuable to get to work with y'all on, on uh, all of those. And, and then, yeah, to have it be a, like, yeah, well, this is just the way it's supposed to work is always, it's really gratified when, when uh, we hear that from people because, that's what we want. We want it to work the way patrons expect, and, and we don't want that friction um, on implementation go live for people to say, like, 
why'd you take away my catalog? I'm like, well, this one just works better. So <laughs> and that's really fun. So. Yeah, we take that. Um, it just makes sense for granted in, in a lot of different other systems that we use every day. So it's definitely nice. <laughs> So thanks for sharing about a little bit how you um, interact and, and were able to work with your, your member libraries, your other like library partners and things. And let's just jump in, uh, do like a little bit of shift into more of this open source community. Um, it's been growing and changing a lot since maybe um, Sam and Bob have you know, became members a couple of years ago and, and to what we're seeing today. So I just wanted to ask um, in what ways are you all um, as, you know, not without us, without Bywater, but as, as libraries using Aspen Discovery, how are you guys able to connect um, and share resources and, and, and talk through things together? Um, through uh, yeah, through meetings question. like this. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, we, we do a lot of kicking, kicking ideas around and then reaching out, like we'll post something on, on Slack to the Aspen community. There's an Aspen community Slack for those that didn't know you should join it. Um, say, Hey, has anyone encountered this or, or thinking of doing something or other, you know, trying not to reinvent the wheel constantly as chances are someone else might be interested, or if you are doing something that might be kind of cutting edge, um, sharing those things or your thought process behind them and inviting people to, to play and comment and whatnot. We, we had um, a, another library recently joined with Aspen. Um, I don't think they'll mind a shout out. It's Darien Library um, and to my mind, their SOPAC had been probably the best OPAC that was out there for a number of years and, and certainly well integrated into their website. And so one day when I saw them join the, the Aspen community Slack and then um, someone that works there start, start sending out questions and ideas, it was just like, wow, look at that. This is so awesome. Look who's joined our community. Yeah, I, I think uh, we take advantage of uh, the, there's Aspen gatherings, the, there's an exchange of ideas uh, there, yeah, Slack also. Uh, but a lot of times what happens is we are at, we're asking about a particular issue or a development we'd like to see, and then we hear back, somebody else is thinking about that too. So uh, that that's another way that that kind of happens is, a lot of times there's just some congruent thinking and some congruent needs, but a lot of other times uh, from uh, going to some of those gathering me meetings, you learn how different everybody's needs are. And uh, and back when it was just uh, like Sam and I and not much else, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we could talk real closely about what our particular needs are, but now it's a much larger group of people. So you're getting a lot more input and it's really fantastic because this stuff really uh, works better when there's uh, a variety of ideas, input, and solutions coming in. We're the new kids on the block. Um, but yeah, I would second everything you've, you've said. So, uh, using Slack has been great. Um, I'll say we, were, we recently started regular meetings with our um, fellow Cersei Dynex. Uh, Aspen libraries, um, which has been super helpful to hear, because even within the same ILS, we do things so differently, <laughs> um, and that also impacts Aspen. Um, so that's been that's been really great. And um, I will say we got on Aspen because we reached out to um, James at Nashville, um, like, hey, tell us about your catalog, uh, which I think at the time was not Aspen quite yet, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, what, what was the, the earlier incarnation? And um, yeah, and now we're starting to get the same libraries reaching out like, hey, what do you think? Um, so it's it's nice to have those, you know, just kind of those, those connections to help spread the word and talk to other folks about what their, um, their needs are. 
So you guys mentioned the Aspen gathering. So for people watching that might not know, um, as a, a group at for Bywater, we invite everyone to join us monthly, to everyone in the community, anyone that's interested in Aspen. Um, and we've been doing that now for over a year, year and a half, I'm not even sure, but um, it's been a while and we get maybe, you know, 40, 30 to 40 members will come. We'll talk about priorities for developments, like any news, things like that, just to stay in touch. But something has kind of branched off from that. And we have a couple of people that are sort of like spearheading that, but um, can you all talk a little bit about the community meetings that you've started and, and kind of um, the, the purpose or the intention of those? Uh, you know, it's um, nice because there are um, a lot of different underlying ILSs that people use. Um, it's nice to, to kind of meet in a, I don't know, vendor neutral space. Um, Bywater is not quite like most other vendors, vendors in that regard. Um, but um, e even so, it's nice to have a, a user led community, community group, community space. Um, and I've, I've been bad. I've missed the last couple. So Tara can, might be able to speak better to current goings on. But again, just a way to support one another as, as end users, help people feel like they're, they're not alone and build in some of that networking opportunity. Um, maybe to some degree help prioritize things that, you know, we need to adjust this or fix that, or this would be a great idea, potentially looking at some community sponsored um, initiatives down the road. Covered everything, Sam. And I, we, we're only, we're about to have our third meeting, I believe. So <laughs> you'll, I think you only missed one, but it might feel like a lot because we're in our early days, but um, yeah, so far it's been a good group and we've had lots of topics. Um, some, you know, kind of some things that are like, oh, maybe we want Bywater to work on this um, development wise to just like, can you add a library card to Apple Wallet? I don't know. <laughs> um, general questions um, about, you know, technology and, and our libraries. So it's been, it's been a good group. I think one of the coolest things coming out of the community is it's always fun for me and for the entire Aspen team to see see the community doing different things. And will every once in a while be, you did what with Aspen? How'd you manage to do that? And it's always like some cool theming things or, or just customization. So, um, and like one of the examples is, I think McKinney, Texas was the first one that did it. And they put a banner across the entire uh, top of, of Aspen. Um, and we just have libraries copying um, that and, and uh, mimicking how that works. And, and uh, everybody in the community is really generous with their time and knowledge, which is amazing. So uh, other libraries can do that. And it kind of pushes us to be like, oh, maybe we should just make a default customization option for that and see what we can do to make it easier for, um, for libraries. Uh, but it, so fun to see all of the different ways that people are using it that we don't expect. So, um, and Sam was like, Sam having the idea for, hey, how do we put all of our digital archives materials in and uploading them directly to the catalog? So um, the community is really our best source of ideas for things to make. So it's really cool. This, this is a good example if you don't feel like you want to participate or have time for all the meetings. I've never been to this particular meeting. It's good to know it's there if I, if I do want to attend, but uh, it's not a particular meeting uh, that that I've gone to. Uh, so there, there are different levels of engagement, of course, you can have uh, for sure. And another thing that we're starting to see, and I don't think this is formal anywhere, but we're starting to see groups of users in a geographical area that you know, we, we get together with our consortium and we found out there's five or six other places using this stuff. And, and I think we're going to schedule our first group kind of a Zoom chat or pandemic and weather permitting going out to lunch at some point, you know, and um, just, just kind of brainstorming 
more geographically as well. Um, but this this still just amazes me how involved someone can be if they so choose at, at any level of this. So I was also thinking about the header and I was I was going to use that same example because I just thought it was so cool. Like we saw one library use it and then Uenta was using it and then another library was using it and then another and then Mark was just like, you know what? We're just going to in a future release, we're just going to make it. So like this is one of the default settings. And it was just like a little thing that it knowing that a library started to use that customization, it allowed us to know that this was an important to you or like it was a priority to you and then you wanted it to function. And I don't think that we would have thought about that if it wasn't for, you know, libraries starting to like copy each other and and start to use it and ask questions about it. So that is that's just been such a like from a design perspective, such a cool thing to see. Um, and I think um, Sam, you shouted out Darian and I think the the stuff that Amanda is doing and her team are doing at Darian is is going to be another um, really push for all of us. And but when they officially go live, I think if you haven't um, peaked or looked at her links that she's posted in Slack, um, it's it's going to uh, blow a lot of people away. So we're excited to see what they're going to do with it. Um, what other developments or have, have you all brought forth? I know you all have, but have you brought forth ideas that you want to like brag about or functionality um, that you are using um, in Aspen that, you know, you brought up, it was a conversation and now um, you're using it? Well, we, we typically get requests from our libraries and then go, well, it doesn't hurt to ask. So one example, I think uh, we have uh, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Library, uh, which always has a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, but uh, one of the ones initially is they wanted to basically instead of they, they wanted to be able to directly uh, load P PDFs and attach them to uh, existing records. And that really met their needs because you could request a physical copy or you could just download it. Uh, so uh, that, that was kind of at that time uh, brand new to the system. And it was just a matter of uh, let's see if we can do this. Sure, you have that need, let's do that. So that's really our approach. Uh, for me, I, you know, I'm not being in a library often these days, particularly since uh, we're not doing all the traveling I was talking about earlier. Uh, you know, these ideas wouldn't just come to me like a lightning strike, but our, our libraries have these needs that uh, that come out of the blue and we, we just try to figure out a way to make them work. And so that's where most of our good innovation comes from is from the ground up. And then say, I know um, we were really excited that Bywater was so game to add in some accessibility checking and and, and enhancements because that's definitely a big priority for us. So um, yeah, we really wanted to give our libraries the freedom to go wild and customize their catalogs to their heart's content. But we also wanted to make sure you know people can read things that there's not like <laughs> you know yellow links on a white background that patrons aren't going to be able to see. Um, so yeah, so by water built in some um, accessibility checking into the theme so you can make sure everyone can read all your stuff and pick whatever colors you want. And that's been great. Everyone's been really happy with that and appreciates the, the kind of checking for them so they don't have to like plug every decision into a little <laughs> color contrast checker. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of other stuff behind the scenes that helps a lot too um, that I know folks are really appreciative of. That helps us out a lot when a library wants to do something that is like a really bad idea and we can just point to that and just say, I'm sorry, it's, it's telling us no. Uh, we'll, we'll not let you use that yellow, that yellow uh, typeface. That's not going to work. Blame Aspen, right? Sam, would you mind talking a little bit about Web Builder? Because that's what I was thinking about for you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so for, for us, um, we have a, an overworked IT staff in the county, and um, I'd still be waiting for them to get around to the library's website. 
um, from my original request to them to work on it in about 2007. Um, so, you know, we'd probably get to it another 20 years, but, um, so we, when we were talking with Mark about this, it was, well, let's do a proof of concept and let's see if we can build within Aspen or what became Aspen, the ability to produce websites and basically use the thing as a CMS. The idea being that, uh, you know, sometimes I've got, um, volunteers that, are the ones that actually know the content of this particular program the best. And they ought to be able to at least draft up that information and put it, put it up there. And, um, and so we, we iterated back and forth for a period of a couple of months and until we felt like we had something that was uh, good and workable. And, and, you know, there were a lot of innovation moments of, Hey, we're entering the same information in three places. That should just be something that we can grab and plug in anywhere we want. And Mark, uh, jumped on those things as they came up. Um, and then um, we, we went live. And then as other partners came in, they had some good ideas and, oh, well, let's, let's change this editor to do this, this thing. It makes it easier and, and there's less hand coding. And, and so it, it's matured. And I think just about every release of Aspen and uh, they got one almost every month or sometimes more um, has had some, additional capability, minor tweak adjustment um, with Web Builder. And so we use Web Builder exclusively as our, our website for our library. Um, we're actually toying with how we can do that for our museum, actually, and set up a branch for a, a branch that's like called Heritage Museum um, and see how that works. And that poses some unique proof of concept challenges as well. So we'll see what we end up doing there, but, um, but it's been a great tool. It's added a lot of um, capability. Um, after about a year after we went live on Aspen, Wasatch County Library, a neighbor in Utah joined us and they had a similar issue with their IT. Um, they're very good, talented, I should say IT department. They're just overwhelmed um, and Juan was able, Juan, their director was able to jump in to Web Builder and get a website going, something that he can edit and change as needed, and which sounds like a minor thing, but when when you're kind of the sole um, person doing this and a dozen other things, it's a really big deal to not have to go through the committee to get something changed on a website. More power to committees if you're of the scale where they come in handy. They definitely have their purpose, but. Anyway, I'll add we use the Web Builder not just for a full scale website development, but it just allows for additional customization. If somebody wants links at the top, we can do that. Somebody wants to throw, you know, like a embed a video here. There's just a lot more flexibility that we have now. So even if our libraries aren't uh, using it fully as a replacement for a website, there are a lot of applications there just to enhance the existing uh, discovery. Yeah, I, I've really noticed it recently. There's a lot of um, smaller libraries, like you said, maybe they don't even have an IT staff and maybe someone someone created a uh, WordPress, I don't know, five years ago or something, and they've still been using that. Um, and it's just been really gratifying to especially see this. some of our smaller libraries have access to like a, a modern, um, easy, like easy to use um, website now, because we're seeing more and more libraries using it as their full, um, op like not just OPAC, but their main library website. So we're just grateful that that was, you know, one library's conversation that now it's, it's helping people um, in a completely different state across the country. And it's helping their, you know, community access their library and get information. So it's just, that's, I think that's just like one of the most amazing things about um, the open source community and why we wanted to talk today. Um, those are my thoughts, but I was wanting to ask you all um, if you, for someone who, you know, is watching who doesn't know much about open source or maybe interested in it, um, could you all share some kind of like either myths busting things or um, things that you like about open source that you could share? Yeah, open source has a lot of different flavors and a lot of different models. Uh, so uh, we use Koha as our ILS and 
that has a very different kind of community that uh, that is around it than Aspen is at this point. It's been around a lot longer. It's been global a lot longer, although that's changing with Aspen as well. So, uh, th so right now it's kind of an exciting time because uh, even though there's uh, it's a smaller community, things are really happening a lot faster than they are possible on Koha. But that's not like a bad thing for other types of open source models. You get uh, there's there's a nice uh, stability in that exists in Koha, and a lot of people checking things, uh, making sure they're right, uh, that type of thing. So. So, th so that's one thing I would, would say is open source is not just uh, one size fits all. It kind of depends on, on the product and the community that's around it. I would also say the other misconception is that you're going to have to hire a lot of staff to make open source work. And, and that can be true, uh, or you might be leveraging existing staff you have if you want to go it on your own. Uh, and not go uh, a supported route. And that's cer there's certainly a lot of libraries that have had a lot of success doing that, uh, but we don't have like a dedicated web developer or anything like that on staff. We can't afford to do that. So uh, going the hosted route for us allows us to not have to do, go spend a lot of staff time on a lot of things that uh, the Bywater is currently doing. Uh, for us. So in other situations, it makes sense to go the other way. But that's kind of the cool thing about open source is you, you do have that option. And it's not a requirement that you have to have somebody doing coding and development on your staff. Uh, it is just, a, it, but you, you can, you can even be hosted and have somebody do coding. And there's a lot of different ways to make it work. I guess I could say we're sort of that we are self-hosted, but we don't have a ton of staff for development. So we're definitely happy to have the development support. And um, yeah, it'll, certainly we couldn't have releases of that at the speed <laughs> that Bywater is, is releasing. And that's been really great to have such, such frequent updates. Um, and yeah, certainly we were, um, before Aspen was available, we were very interested in, in PICA, um, but we're nervous, like, could we do this on our own? So um, yeah, th having the support essentially meant, kind of took it from like, I'm, I'm not sure we can do this. So like, yes, we can definitely confidently um, do this at a, at a large scale. I, I just echo, um, what Tara and, and Bob said, um, but it's, you know, the free puppy thing again, um, there's, there's some work or expectation of it at some point. Um, I, and you know, the, the difference between the co-water and the, the co-water, the Koha community, um, and, and the Aspen one, um, Red Hat, any of those others, they're all like Bob said, they all kind of have their unique um, ways of getting involved. And, and we're still discovering some of those within Aspen. So if you're interested in any of this and you want to get involved, now is a great time. You can help define what some of those needs and roles are. Um, I think right now it's, um, it's helping, helping take the world of innovations that are out there and... Um, helping, you know, cue those up a little bit um, as the as the community's grown, as the user base has grown, there are some growing pains. Um, what what developments do you do you focus on? What do you, you know, say, ah, oh, say I'm sorry, that one uh, can't use that yellow color, you know, it doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't pass muster. Um, I and you know, we haven't even talked about like so much else that's out there. Like, uh, do we, uh, is it advantageous to develop smart speaker skills for things like library catalogs, discovery layers? Um, you know, do we, what do we do about privacy? Um, what are the ethics of, of everything that, that, that we're working on, who holds the intellectual property? Yes, it's open source. 
And did someone take time to um, legally organize and secure any of this property under one of those things, or is it just just assumed? You know, the, some of those growing pains that come out of open source type projects. Um, and when one thinks of these projects, I think the first thought is development or usability testing. But I think there's definitely a role for people to be involved in in that side of it too, like. Um, you know, what can you do to help support and make sure that this IP stays, stays open? I'll add another thing about open source that makes me feel super excited uh, to be in that is uh, it, I just look at what's happening with pr proprietary software in the library world. And it is getting more and more consolidated. And if I were on one of those, I'd be very concerned about where that's going and what my options are. And uh, will I be forced to migrate to a system maybe I didn't choose and incur that expense? So that's one thing that uh, I think it used to be considered bold if you were part of open source. And that more and more now, I think it's not so much bold as it is just uh, maybe it, it, in not, maybe not all cases, but in a lot of cases, a smarter place to be looking at kind of where things are headed. We totally agree. <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> well, I think the, the really great thing about like working in libraries too, is that um, we know like the needs of libraries are forever changing. If, if the last two years hasn't you know showed us anything um, and the ability to be able to respond in such a, a quick and um, intuitive manner, I think, um, for the future is just like what really excites me about open source um, is and the thing, the way that you all and your ideas and your direct like input from your communities are, are pushing it forward every day is just, it's so, it's amazing to see even in the last like two years, sometimes I'll go back and look at like our old tutorial videos or something. And it's just amazing to see like how far we've come. And that's because of, you know, direct involvement from libraries across the globally now um, and listening and responding to their communities. So um, if anyone has any other like final thoughts, I think that's a really good stopping point. Um, we appreciate your time as always. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it then. And we're gonna get excited for PLA in two weeks, which is our first in-person national conference in two years. This was the last one that we attended in March of 2020. And I think the week after, the day after, the week something, everything changed. So we're very excited to uh, to be there again. Jesse? We'll be at booth 1216, so make sure you stop by and say hello. We're excited to see our partners. All right, well, come to the community meeting March 15th. And you can find us uh, every month at the Aspen Gathering, the first Thursday of every month at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>